Awesome. All right. Well, we're back immediately back in the studio, GND 12, and pretty excited for for this one here. I've got uh, a, a big fan of this guy. We've got uh, current MP of uh, Foothills, Alberta, John Barlow. Welcome. Thanks very much for having me. It's an honor. Lucky 12, right? <laughs> there you go. It yeah. is lucky 12. It's got to be lucky. 13 would have been a little rough, but 12, I think, is good. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm really excited to have you here. Um, we, uh, I, I should let you know up front, our, our family, or at least the family that I married into, we um, <clears throat> vehement, vehemently, vehemently, passionately, <laughs> <laughs> we'll go that route, talk politics, always have. Wow. Uh, the entire family, we're all on the same page, mind you, we're all conservative uh, and have been for a long time, but I married into the family in 15 and... Uh, Anyway, we're just, we're big fans, so we talk lots of politics, and so they were very excited that I get to, to chat to you today, too, so I, uh, I really appreciate you getting in here. Well, I didn't feel any pressure at all, but now <laughs> I suddenly I feel a little anxious. That, yeah, uh, you got to bring the heat. Yeah, you got to bring sorry, the heat. That I better live up to these expectations. But <laughs> no, that's that's great. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it is important that uh, families and Canadians are talking about uh, politics, about the intru- issues that are impacting them every single day. You know, for us in Canada, a lot of the times people are paying much more attention to what's going on south of the border mm. uh, than what's really going on in here in Canada. So, you know, anytime that we, we hear that uh, Canadians are paying attention, that, that's a good sign. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I would agree. And uh, we were just mentioning off air, but I, you, you've got some cracked ribs on you. How, uh, yeah, how are we doing? How are the ribs? We're, we're, it's been six weeks, so we're, we're on the mend. Uh, my doctor said it'd be six to nine. I said, that that seems like a long time. Well, why so long? He said, well, you're old. I, oh, <laughs> that's great. Bedside manner. Thanks for that, <laughs> Tips. I very much yeah. appreciate it. <laughs> so that way, and that was on the ice. Like, you, you play hockey. You're, you're a goalie. And did you did you play uh minor uh, junior what did you play yeah, no i just i played like minor hockey like everybody in rural yep. saskatchewan and mm-hmm. um just played you know some some pretty good hockey out here in southern alberta when i moved mm-hmm. out here in 94 mm-hmm. uh, but nothing you know nothing high level just uh, some beer league with the, with the guys and so it's uh you know still playing and it's always something i enjoy those are the best leagues beer league hockey nothing better no so i tell everybody you know you <laughs> enjoy junior whatever you're doing now but uh the best times you'll have is when uh, you're playing beer leagues with your buddies and you know, those, those uh, chats and laughs you have in the dressing room <laughs> afterwards is better than anything that happens on the ice. Yeah, so true. I, uh, I hear you there. And, well, I guess so you, like you said, you cut your chops in um, in Regina. Or, yeah. or in Regina? Is that where you grew up? Or Yeah, just outside of Regina. Outside? White City area. Yeah, White City, Belgonia White area. City, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And uh, so when did you when did you leave home, I guess, or when did you leave from there, from Regina? Yeah, we went to, I went to high school in Yorkton. And, mm-hmm. then, uh, you know, like many other... Uh, Saskatchewan folks in the late 80s, early 90s, uh, there was a mass exodus uh, to Alberta for the mm-hmm. Alberta Advantage. And, you know, I'll remember uh, very distinctly, um, Lauren Calvert was the premier of Saskatchewan at that time. Wow. And I wasn't, you know, super politically engaged, like, you know, late late teens at that time. Um, but I distinctly remember him saying, we will not develop our natural resources because that will impact our equalization payments. Mm. And uh, my family said, you know what, uh, go to Alberta, there's nothing for you here. Um, yeah. You know, if, if we have a government that just wants us to rely on welfare, uh, that's that's not certainly what I wanted and not how I was raised. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, like uh, hundreds of thousands of other Saskatchewan <laughs> folks, I came to Alberta and, and mm-hmm. never looked back. Yeah, the mass the mass exodus and uh, migration to Alberta. Well, I was probably a part of maybe what would be the second migration. I think the, the first one would be the 80s. And yeah. I came here in, um, after school, and well, 2000 was really the first time I, I had come. And so, I mean, 05, 06 would have been that first boom. But I, yeah. before that, you know, oil boom, um, people were already moving here. I just remember reading the numbers. I think the population was like 700,000 or something at the time when I first moved here. And there were something like 40 people a day that were moving in. Yeah. It was just, they were just coming in droves uh, yeah. for, for, like you said, the Alberta advantage. It's so attractive to come here. It's it really the most opportunity I felt at the time that laid here too. I'm sure it was the same in the eighties. Yeah. You know, it was just, um, it was like you were coming to a, a, a different energy. Um, you know, nothing, you know, Saskatchewan's always going to be part of who I am and, and mm-hmm. I'm still a Ryder fan. That will never, never change. <laughs> um, hey, but, I know the, uh, the new head coach. Oh, is that right? We're okay. going to get him in here. Corey, okay. Corey Mace. Awesome. I'm yeah. He's coming for, on. Excited to have him as the coach this mm-hmm. year. I'm uh, looking forward to some good things, but yeah, um, 
well, if you do, let me know. I'll make sure I watch. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, and, for sure. Um, but yeah, it, it just came to, you know, they called it the Alberta Advantage, but it truly was the Alberta Advantage where mm. you had Saskatchewan where um, was just sort of stuck in a rut, and but you had Alberta who was risk takers, entrepreneurs, mm. always driving for for something better, and, and it just kind of rubbed off on you. You just couldn't couldn't help but uh, kind of get excited. Now, I didn't go in the oil and gas sector, maybe mm. maybe not the, <laughs> the smartest long-term decision. I went into journalism, but, mm-hmm. uh, you know, yeah. still exciting to be a part of, be to, to grow up here and raise my family here in Alberta. Yeah, no, it's an excellent province. I fell in love with it right away. Actually, I fell in love with Saskatchewan first, to be mm. truthfully honest, because I went out there to school first yeah. <clears throat> before here, but then I just felt this was the perfect blend of, like you said, entrepreneurs and everybody was just working hard and yeah. to get ahead. So, um, yeah, you said you, you studied journalism, you went over to SAIT, yeah. Right. What, so, what year did you go uh, to SAIT? Uh, I would have graduated SAIT in '93, so '91, mm-hmm. '92, '93 in there somewhere. Yep. Yeah. Jur- well, you should be on this side. <laughs> asking. <them. laughs> no, I, I had I had my twenty. You had your time. I've done. I've done. Yeah, yeah. So you've got a big, long career in in journalism, and um, you ended up working for well, I guess the big one would be the, like the Western Wheel, of course. But, yeah. But, and you were editor at the Western Wheel. That's right. That's right. Um, but you worked your way up to there. So, what were some of the papers that you worked on or organizations? Yeah, you know, I started out uh, an internship at the Calgary Sun, uh, which was a great experience. Mm. Uh, you know, uh, Rick Bell, the Dinger, and <laughs> some of these guys are still around. You know, I learned yeah. a lot, learned a lot from him, and I still stay in regular touch with them. And mm-hmm. um, you know, I worked for um, Western Hockey League, Canadian Hockey League magazine, the oh, Hitmen. Nice. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you know, started out kind of in sports, but mm-hmm. um, you know, we were actually talking about this yesterday because uh, yesterday was the day the 30th anniversary of John Candy passing away. Oh wow! Um, and just, this is just how strange life can be sometimes i was living in uh, a friend's brother's garage in bridgeland at this time uh, <laughs> you know not uh, making a ton of money but yep. um i you know i forgot you know I, i'm gonna go back to saskatchewan and, and i'll kind of figure things out and where i want to go from here and mm-hmm. uh, my car was packed literally packed running uh, i was literally getting in the car and i heard the phone ring in the house and i'm like oh man do i really want it's not even my house but I'll be a nice guy. And I ran into the house and it was the High River Times. The owner was uh, Bill Holmes Sr. Okay. And uh, he called and said, hey, I, I heard uh, you might be looking for a job. Any interested in coming out to High River? I'm like, yeah. where's where's High River? <laughs> but, uh, you know, my car's packed. It's running. Sure. I'll, yeah, I'll, so I'm I'll, ready to go. I'll come out there. I'll, I'll make a little side trip on my way back to Saskatchewan. Mm-hmm. Um, but when I drove into High River, I immediately fell in love with the place. Like, what a, a, an amazing town. It mm. reminded me of, of small town Saskatchewan. It a would. It would. Uh, and I just walked in the office. I said, you hire me right now. I'll, I'll guarantee I'll stay with you for three years. And, mm-hmm. you know, 30 seconds later, who knows where my life would be. Uh, but that, uh, I'm very glad I ran back in the house and answered that phone call. Oh, that's great. Yeah. So that probably the high river was, well, it, yeah, it's uh, like moving essentially to another home, like home, home away from home, really, because there's a lot of similarities, just more hills. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Mountains. A L- little nicer view to the west. Nicer than, uh, view. <laughs> than yeah. Saskatchewan, but. Very rural though. Yeah. Yeah. yeah very rural. Um, you know, th- you got that small town feel, you know, yeah. Calgary was close by, but, um, you know, I'm not a city guy at all. I didn't really mm-hmm. enjoy living in Calgary as much. Um, mm-hmm. so I, I much preferred that, that small town, that small town feel and, and High River was just perfect. And, and I, you know, I've been there ever since. Perfect fit. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, <clears throat> well, yeah, I have to, it, it's an interesting, transition and i don't know maybe, maybe it's not unlike a lot of stories in into into politics but um so you said 20 years you spent uh, as as a journalist and yeah, an editor and yeah three or four years at the high river times and then yeah. i went to oak Tokes, uh, and i was there for 17 and a half mm-hmm. or so and uh, mm-hmm. so as, as editor and then regional editor when we uh, started expanding and became a partner of, uh, with great west newspaper group at that time mm-hmm. um so yeah i was kind of a got out of the writing as much and, and more into the administration, which kind of helped me a little bit, you know, running a business and, and sure. worrying about staff and payroll and, and budgets mm-hmm. and all that stuff. So it was kind of a nice little foundation to transition into politics, which, you know, one never knows when that's going to happen. And <laughs> I certainly did not have that as a, as a lifetime goal of things just, uh, you know, pop up now and again, but I, this being a journalist and kind of understanding a small business really gave me a good, a good foundation for good that. foundation. Yeah. yeah. Well, that, that, that does make sense. And obviously being in, in the news world and the newsworthy world, you would have been following, um, you know, a lot of politics as well. And, 
uh, as you get older, I find, you know, you get more pinch points and things that strike a nerve a little more the older you get and things bother you about maybe how things are going or looking. So how did you, yeah, was there something that irked you that drove you to get into politics or? Yeah, there wasn't really um, a specific issue, uh, mm-hmm. but I think what, I think just more people came to me and expressed that they thought I would be good at this. Oh. Um I think part of that is, is, as you said, is being a journalist and especially in small towns where you're at every community event, you are telling people stories every single day. So Mm -hmm. I knew the families, I knew the businesses, um, people trusted me. Um, I was, I knew how to ask questions. I knew how to listen. So I I just think I had built a, you know, a strong reputation in in the the area when the opportunity arose. Um, You know, people came to me and said, you know, we, we think you'd be really good at this is something you'd want to do. Yeah. Um, initially I said no. <laughs> so <laughs> Did you? Yeah. Uh, I just, I, it's a bit, you know, it's a huge shift, a uh, big change. Uh, you're opening yourself up to, a, yeah. you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of criticism. Um, it's a my, greasy world. It's a sometimes. tough, it's, it's a tough, tough goal. And it's, mm-hmm. it's just progressively gotten worse with, with social media yeah. and, and some other yeah. things. But mm-hmm. my wife was, uh, she was smart. She said, you know, if, if you don't do this, um, I know you'll regret it for the rest of your life. You will mm-hmm. be good at this. And, and you know, we're behind you. And when you have your family behind you, that, that makes all the difference. Yeah, it sure does. That seems to be a common theme that pops up in a lot of my discussions with people, you know, uh, like like a rare opportunity and then the, that support system at home and then, you know, your support saying you need to go or you're going to regret it if you don't do this. And that so that's good to have that. Did you, um, and that's your wife, that's uh, names, uh, Louise? Louise, right? yeah. Louise, yeah. And yeah. Uh, so had you guys had any children at that point? I can't, I don't remember. Yeah, we oh. had, uh, we have three kids. Yeah, you've got three. You know, they were a little bit older, so I just had one in high school still at that point. So they yeah. made, it, made it a bit of an easier decision if I had mm-hmm. three young kids all still in school and in mm-hmm. sports and activities. Yeah. You know, we spent so much time away in Ottawa. It's, it would be, that would be a challenge. Now, obviously, mm-hmm. Some of my colleagues do it, and they manage very well. Um, but that, that's a lot of a lot to ask of, of your family. So for us, that the timing was was good, um, mm. and it, it it did work out. But if if you don't have that that family support behind you, you, you should not go into this. Yeah, because you almost have to prep everybody for the <laughs> mud and the sling, and that could potentially go on. And yeah, unfortunately, right? you know, I my mean, kids get it um, a little. You know, a little bit. They see what happens on social media or in the mm. you know in the news and. And, uh, you know, obviously they don't want to see dad get, get hammered either, but for the most no. part, um, you know, and my, and my, again, my wife was, <laughs> was pretty good when I first got elected. Uh, I spent a lot of sleepless nights cause you're, mm-hmm. it's, it's human nature, right? You, you just assume everybody's going to like you. Well, that's not, <laughs> not how it goes. <laughs> and I would just lie yeah. in bed at night and, and I, and I just, I don't know why I, this person's upset. I, yeah. I was, why can't I turn these well, people? Why can't I, why can't I yeah. appease them? And she said, well, how many emails and phone calls do you deal in a week? And I said, Oh, I don't know, probably five or 600. And mm. she goes, you're, you're worried about the one. What about the other 599 that are right. really happy with life, everything you're doing? And I'm like, that is a much better perspective. <laughs> yeah. And so that, every, th- every time I, I started thinking about it that way, just, you know what, the customer isn't always right. And there's yep. just at some point you used to say, you know, I've done everything I possibly can, uh, you know, I'm mm-hmm. sorry, but we're just going to have to leave it at that. And, and I've got, 140,000 constituents that I have to help and, mm-hmm. and you know, other people need my time. Yeah. We can agree to disagree. Yeah. No, that's really, uh, we need a lot more of that in this day and age. It's, uh, everybody feels this kind of divide push pull to the left or the right or whatever label they want to put on it. But really yeah. we can agree to disagree and that's okay. We can still be pals or friends or, or for uh, sure, you know, cordial. Yeah. And, and the vast majority of people are, they just want, they just want you to know that, that you listened and you heard them. Yeah. Most of the time they hurt. understand you may be out, may not be able to solve their, their problem. A lot of times we can, mm-hmm. um, but sometimes they, they just want to vent. They just want to rant. And as long as you listen and you phone them back, um, it's, it's usually a pretty good, pretty good result. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. And so your um, well, I guess your first, your entry in, uh, while well, you were elected in, in the by-election, which would have been 14, but, but prior in 12, you actually ran against Danielle in the, yeah. in the general election. That was, so that was your first. Yeah. First run, how yeah, yeah, how was that experience? You know, that, that was a great learning experience. That was, I don't want to say it was a lark. It was more, um, no one in the riding was going to run against Danielle. And, I, and again, I wasn't, I was a political neophyte. I was a journalist. I covered it, but I'd never run for anything before. Mm-hmm. And it just kind of irked me. I guess when you asked earlier if, this, mm. if anything irked you, it just irked me that no one in the riding was going to run. I, I really believe that the 
person who represents your your riding, your constituency, you should be local. You should have roots. You should know the area. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I'm going to run and at least make her work for it. And uh, well, it was a tight. It was a tight one. Yeah, we did. We <laughs> Danielle and I joke about it now. And yeah, <laughs> for yeah. sure. She said, you know, you made me work a lot harder than I was anticipating. <laughs> uh, so you know, we. Um, but it was it was a good learning experience. You know, to, yeah. And at that time, I certainly had no idea that the federal opportunity would come just a year later. Mm-hmm. So I think that really just introduced me to a lot of people who didn't know um, what I what I was about, and mm-hmm. and I think it just. Uh, people had a lot of confidence in me that if I could go through that ringer and go toe to toe with the leader of the Wild Rose Party, yeah, um, you know, I, I th- they think I could handle the the federal job too. It's a hell of a first show, right? Oh. I mean, come in as a essentially nobody, if you want to call it that, and, and to take yeah. on the the big dog. Yeah. Well, and and Danielle's very good. Like, yeah, she's such a good speaker, and, she, mm-hmm. and she's doing such a great job as premier. But mm-hmm. I will pr- probably the biggest moment in my political career that I will always remember mm. other than being walked into the House of Commons. But yeah. we had the first debate between Danielle and I at, uh, it was at the Centennial Center in Okotoks. <laughs> there had to be 1,200 people there okay. and it was rowdy. It was loud. Yeah. Obviously the Wild Rose. Beer Gardens, were, hey? Oh, yeah. man. <laughs> and I'd never done anything like this before. I just walked in like, holy shit. Like, what have I got myself yeah, I into? Bet. Were you nervous? Yeah. Oh, you like, yeah. yeah. So nervous. Yeah. Um, but you know what? I held my own. Like, mm-hmm. I, I would. I went blow to blow with her and, and I, th- I think I did very well and won a few mm-hmm. points and mm-hmm. came out of there at the worst even. Um, and I, th- yeah. I thought, okay, like I, I can got do this. That. I can do it. Yeah. I can do it. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, I mean, you clearly very good speaker and I know that was your first test, but you're articulate and you're sharp and you understood politics. So it's good, good on you for throwing it down that way. But so now yeah, not like a year, year and a half later, uh, I guess. So Ted Menzies resigns and then opening Pops up, I guess, at the time that riding was McLeod. Yeah. Right. Which is Foothills now? Foothills now. Yeah. Same thing. Yeah. Okay. And so, and you won that resoundingly. That was. Yeah. It was a, the nomination to be the conservative candidate was probably the bigger slog for sure. Like you, mm. there was four of us running to be the conservative candidate. Um, so that was a, that was a three or four month. It, you know what, Kevin, it was such a crazy uh, couple of years there. Mm. You know, I had to win a nomination to run provincially. Then we had the provincial election. Then, you know, I don't know if he was in a year, the nomination for the federal conservative uh, candidacy, and then mm-hmm. that by-election, and then a year later an election. So we had yeah, five no, elections, yeah. really, in the span of less than two years. And right. So we were exhausted. Oh, I bet. Yeah, I hadn't, I hadn't thought about that. Yeah, because when you, when you just think about it, you just have a flashes of these years. But yeah, you were campaigning all, campaigning oh, all the time. Oh, it's nonstop. Nonstop. <laughs> just a dog and pony show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, that's that's fantastic. Well, and that, uh, I mean, you couldn't re- represent a prettier riding, that Foothills, which kind of runs like west to Bragg and then Bragg Creek, which is west of Calgary, down to is that all, right down to the border? And yeah, right, right down to the Montana border. Down yeah. to the Montana border. I mean, we we have a spot in um, Whitefish, nice. in Montana, before Yellowstone. Sorry, oh. Foster. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, <laughs> we bought it in 2011. So uh, we were the trendsetters. Yeah, <laughs> they followed. But so, but my favorite part of that drive is uh, the Cowboy Trail, 22 on Highway 22. You know, all the uh, the drive through the mountains and just the views. And while well, so many movies have been shot there, yeah. right? The Revenant and Game of Thrones and I don't know, the list goes on. Um, Interstellar, I think, and Inception, yep. uh, Last of Us. I don't know. Countless movies. The Revenant, right? Yeah. Um, it, it's beautiful. So, I mean, you, that's a pretty good setting for riding to represent, right? That's not the worst. <laughs> that's hey? for sure, yeah. Man, all, the, all those... Uh, ranchers and cattle ranchers and beef and yeah. uh yeah yeah i i, I love my riding yeah. uh the, to the bottom of my heart like the, the people who live in in foothills are just salt of the earth mm-hmm. uh hard working um you know but they will give you the shirt off their back to help help you or help their neighbor mm-hmm. um you know we've we've been through floods we've been through droughts um you know it's incredible how the people of Foothills always step up in a time of need. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it, it's certainly one of the most beautiful places on, on planet earth. And, um, yeah. you know, when you have a, a beautiful setting with incredible people, it, it doesn't get much better than that. Yeah. They are the best people for sure. Well, they work, they work their tails off. I mean, that's a hard life. The, the farmers and you represent those guys and we'll, 
We'll get to some of that stuff right now too, but I guess, you, so you've had a long career already now uh, yeah. in, in politics. And then after winning that, the by-election, then, then you would have been working under uh, Rona Ambrose yep. uh, next, and uh, which she was another, <laughs> we were fanning over. <laughs> yeah. We loved Rona. And I think we were really pushing for her at the time because we wanted her to run. Yeah. I'm talking our family table yeah. and all our politic jabbering daily. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we loved Rona and, but we, the banter was kind of that Pierre would not run because he had a young family or there was rumblings. We weren't sure. So, but we were really hopeful that, that Rona would run, but how was that experience working under her? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I've been really lucky. Um, it's, Obviously, um, you know, having a year under, or you know, a little less than a year under Harper and, mm-hmm. and those guys was great, great to learn, but you're, you kind of have to take a look at, you come into the last year of a majority government where you come in pretty much by yourself. It was sort of like changing high schools halfway through grade 12, where they just throw you in there and you have to figure, <laughs> figure it out on your own. No one was holding my hand yeah. uh, to get me around. So there's only, it's almost like a little bit of a breath of you know, where you could kind of take a step back and kind of get your bearings after we lost that election. And But Rana came in and just did an amazing job. It, mm-hmm. it could have gone completely sideways where, you know, everybody was angry and infighting and all that thing. But mm-hmm. but Rana just did a, a phenomenal job of coming in there and, and calming everybody down and say, okay, yeah, we have to regroup and start rebuilding. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we didn't get decimated in that election. We still had no. 99 members. So yeah. we, we had a really good foundation there and, and Rana did a good job of just sort of mm-hmm. steering the ship until, you know, Andrew Shear won the, the next leadership and, mm-hmm. and did a great job going into 2019 and, and now, <laughs> but I know we've got the right, right guy now. Yeah. Oh, definitely the right guy. And Rana, <laughs> yeah. thanks for correcting me. I kept saying Rona. Oh, it goes either way. Which uh, went under, did it not? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Rona and Lowe's and anyway. Yeah. Um, and so, and then Andrew Shear. So would you have known him from, I mean, he's the Saskatchewan guy. Yeah, I didn't know him uh, before getting in, into yeah. politics, but he was one of the first guys I met uh, when I was elected. He was actually the Speaker of the House at that time. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, again, you just, fate kind of hands you some good hands sometimes. And, you know, I got into the the lobby area, which is kind of just outside the house where all the MPs kind of hang out. Um, mm-hmm. And this uh, blonde girl comes up and she goes, Hey, you're the new guy, right? And I'm like, yeah, I'm the new guy. She says, well, come to the speaker's office. And uh, I want to introduce you to the speaker. There's a few friends will come over and we'll, we'll have a scotch and just get to help you get to know a few people. Mm-hmm. And uh, there's six or seven people in there, including Andrew Shear, and those six or seven people have become some of my best friends, and they are still are to this to this day. Oh, that's fantastic! Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, easy to entice with a nice glass of scotch too. It was so. it wasn't a tough sell to be <laughs> <laughs> to be honest. You're like, uh, what year? Uh, yeah, yeah. If she's ever going to go have some gin, I'm like, eh, no, nah, yeah, I'm, I'm not into that. But. Bombay. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> but the scotch definitely perked my ears up, and uh, yeah. But yeah, you know, just all those kind of little things where where people have. Uh, you know, they see that you're you're a little bit lost, and someone just takes a moment to to take you aside and and make you feel comfortable, make you feel at home, mm-hmm. yeah, bring you into the team, yeah, exactly. And so, how much time were you spending in the earlier years in in Ottawa? Were you, like, how, what's the schedule like? Is it insane or is it? Yeah, it's 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 a little hectic for sure. Um, you know, our our schedules kind of set a year in advance or so. So we, we know we're in Ottawa. The house sits about 145 days of the year. Yeah. So we're in Ottawa almost half, half of the year. Um, mm. So there's a lot of, you know, I, on a typical week, I fly there early Sunday morning mm-hmm. and I try and fly back Thursday night or Friday morning to be in the riding on the weekends. Mm-hmm. So you just kind of got to use, used to a two hour time difference all the time and <laughs> yeah. a lot of airports, uh, which has airports, been a bit of a yeah. challenge now because nothing is on time. Nothing's on time. Nothing, nothing. works. And everybody's just like confused <laughs> and has no idea what their job is. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Whether it's, Air traffic controllers, baggage handlers, weather, you know. No one has a clue. <laughs> no one has a clue. I, I know it's going to leave around this time, and I will be home around that time. <laughs> nothing specific. No, nothing specific. <clears throat> well, and so you've gone through three, uh, I guess, elections, right? 15, 19, and then the snap. 21, yeah. 21. So it's already been a whirlwind for you, like you say. Yeah. Um, I guess where do you see... Well, let's just get into to, to current. I mean, we might as well get into the current affairs. So the big one, obviously, right now, um, 
carbon tax and yeah. you you introduced um bill c234 yeah um and it, that got hung up at the senate level or there was some adversity there yeah really it was one person was it not in the senate that was kind of driving or was it is the senate's role correct the senate is just really supposed to be like a voice of uh nonpartisan um, not to push an agenda through, but just like checks and balances. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's exactly. really okay. But you can explain maybe to me what happened with. Well, two, yeah, two, three, four is a really, in fact, it's, it's never happened before. Um, so it's a private member's bill. So it's yeah. not a government's bill. It's, it's something that uh, a private member puts forward. Mm -hmm. um, we put it forward and it's, again, it's also really difficult for a private member's bill to become law. Uh, yeah, because you're so low on the, the priority list, and so many other things can go sideways. But we managed to get it through the House of Commons with the support of all the opposition parties: the Green, the NDP, the Bloc, mm. and, and obviously ourselves, and a, a sm, you know spattering of of Liberal MPs. I think four or five also support it. Mm. So to get it through the House uh, was a victory all in itself. Sure. So normally, when a private member's bill goes to the Senate, the Senate rarely well, has never amended a private member's bill because they know how hard it is. Mm -hmm. So they're there just to give, kind of give it a once over. They may um, suggest some things here and there, but basically they go through their, the, mo the motions for lack of a better term and, and mm -hmm. send it back to the house for Royal assent. Yeah. What happened this time was unprecedented political gamesmanship where you had the prime minister and the minister of environment, Stephen Gibo, mm -hmm pressuring um, liberal appointed senators to make amendments. And so they made two amendments that kind of, they made it, it was killed, made it, killed, and finally they got them, got them passed. So two amendments which really neuter this bill. Yeah. It wasn't about neutering the bill. It was about trying to kill it through time. Kill it. Yep. Yeah. The, the, by putting the amendments through, they know it has to come back to the House and be debated all over again. Mm -hmm. um, and the longer that takes, the, the less runway we have before another election and then it, then it'll die. We really wanted this to come through because it, it gives some pretty substantial fist financial relief to, to Canadian farmers. And yeah. that's really what this is about. Yeah. And we were talking about f you know, food inflation and affordability. Um, oh, it's the, out of control out there yeah. right now. It's out of control. Yeah. Yeah. And so it was, yeah, it was, again, sorry, uh, relief, no, relief for the farmers yeah. uh, on, and what specifically did they amend or they tried to, it really was the crux of the bill, right? Like the, the yeah. green, uh, greenhouses and... And uh, heating and cooling and barns. Heating and cooling and barns. Yeah. And that's really the, the bizarre thing of all of this. So we are just fixing what the liberals didn't do right the first time when they brought in their Pricing on Pollution Act in 2016. Mm -hmm. They did exempt farm fuels, diesel and gas on yeah. the farm from the carbon tax, which was the right thing to do. Sure. However, again, not really understanding rural Canada and what happens on the farm, yeah. they didn't extend that exemption to natural gas and propane, which are actually the cleaner burning fuels. But in rural Canada, well, you they, rely on them for yeah. heating and cooling of barns, drying grain, mm -hmm. um, heating greenhouses and those things. So all we were doing is like, hey, this was an oversight in the original legislation. Let's fix it. Yeah. This is our second time trying to do it. And the first time with the snap election in 2021 killed mm -hmm. it. Now this is... Uh, so I, I don't understand why they're being so obstinate about this because when, again, when the prime minister took, um, provided an exemption to Atlantic Canada on yeah. home heating, mm -hmm. he's basically admitted that the carbon tax makes life unaffordable and this isn't some, um, you know, untouchable ideological policy because he did mm -hmm. it himself. So yeah. this is really frustrating. I think it's just an attack on, on rural Canada and, and Canadian agriculture and our farmers and ranchers. And mm -hmm. um, when, again, when Canadians are going to food banks on unprecedented numbers, um, this is really a, a, a slap in the face to Canadians who are struggling to put food on the table. Mm -hmm. No, I, well, I couldn't agree more. I just, I've, I've always, I have from day one opposed the carbon tax and it's okay for some people to think, okay, you know, well, maybe there should be a price on pollution. Maybe there should be. We need to do better. And, and, and I'm all for that. But, you know, they should show where that money is going. If they're, uh, you know, putting an extra tax on our personal use of our carbon footprint, then, okay, well, what are you spending that money on? And it looks to the, like, to people like me and just the masses, like they're just spending like drunken sailors and they have been before 
uh, before the pandemic. <laughs> right. It's just like it's out of control. Yeah. Uh, it's completely out of control. And so I don't disagree with you. So uh, where does that stand then now after this? Well, it's, it's back in the House of Commons. It's back in the House. Yeah, so we've debated it uh, two hours now. Um, the problem that I have is I've lost the support of the bloc. Um, so if it goes to a vote here in the next couple of weeks, um, what will ha- we're, we're trying to get those amendments removed. Mm-hmm. So we keep the bill back in its original form, which will help farmers. So the, one of those amendments, as you said, removes the exemption for heating and cooling in barns and greenhouses, yeah. which now will cost, you know, that amendment will cost farmers close to a billion dollars. Um, the it's block nice. is kind of playing some games here. We want that amendment removed back in its original form. If it goes to a vote now, um, the bill will pass amended. So we lose a lot of what we were trying to accomplish. Yeah. It's like a torn apart. Uh, yeah. It's bill. really, it's, it's really a neutered, um, mm. neutered bill, but the liberals kind of want it to pass now uh, because they just want this off their plate. Yeah, they want. So we're now, we're just going to use this as a cudgel for, as long as this takes. Mm-hmm. And I think we have the support of farmers. They, they understand that um, they don't want this bill to pass amended because it doesn't do anything. No, it doesn't do anything at all. Yeah. And so um, and why do you think, I know this is politics, but why do you think the block, how are they getting involved? Like, are we going to go right after, like, is this fall on one guy like Pierre Delfond? Or? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good, uh, good senator name dropper there. Um, you know, I, I think, the block, and this is, you know, for Albertans probably, uh, they'd rather just not talk about the block at all. But no, the block has become kind of an interesting conundrum in and of itself. Mm-hmm. Where, you know, initially they were kind of conservative minded party back in the day with Mulroney and uh, when they kind of split off. Mm-hmm. But they've now kind of become a uh, sort of a two headed little monster where mm-hmm. you have half of that still has that sort of conservative mindset, mm-hmm. but the other half is very environmentally act- activist and the leadership is on that environmental <laughs> activist side. So they right. do not want to um, lose the carbon tax in any way. Right. And unfortunately <clears throat> they're, they're f- those that are more conservative minded are losing the battle. Mm-hmm. And that's what's why we've lost the block support. No, that's just, yeah, that's crazy. Shouldn't, shouldn't be handled that way. And like you said, it's unprecedented because it went to the Senate and then it turned and now, yeah. Um, I don't know how many people actually follow the Senate. Um, <laughs> I, I, I do uh, and our family does, but, yeah. um, and that has changed dramatically obviously since Justin got in. Yeah. Um, so, and you can correct me where I'm wrong, just like a Senate 101, but the Senate is currently 105 members. Yeah. 39 would be the independent senator <laughs> group, right? Yeah. <laughs> With a smirk on my With face. This, yeah, yeah. Independent. Yeah. Independent because they're trying to be nonpartisan. It's a rebrand. Right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> they call it what it is. It's a yeah. rebrand. And then you go into uh, the Canada senators group yeah. led by Scott Tannis. Right. Uh, 17 members in that. And then you've got the Conservative Party, Donald Platt. Yeah. 14. And then you've got the, oh, they don't call themselves liberal, progressive. Progressive, yeah. Which is liberal. Uh, well, anyway, I don't want to put words in anyone's mouth, but pro- progressive Senate group, right? which also has 14 members. And then you've got um, non-affiliated, yeah. 13 members, one less, and there's still like eight vacancies or less or yeah. more. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know what it is. They I just know. appointed six, so I'm not sure where we're at now. But. Yeah, and so that number, that 105 number, that that has stayed the same. I yeah, think. that that will that, that doesn't change. change doesn't right? change. Yeah. Okay, and so uh, Trudeau gets in and makes this promise to blow up. He blows up the Senate and gets everybody out, and we're going to make change and we're going to rebrand and yeah, uh, paint it blue and call it new or <laughs> sort of paint it red and <laughs> whatever you want to call it. Yeah, the red. Uh, what do they call it? What is the red chamber? So he's yeah, the red yeah. chamber, yeah. right? So I mean, now they have to appoint the senators anyway, the current governor, and it's been eight years. So like I heard an alarming stat that there's up to 22 senators that it's maybe less now that have to do a mandatory re- uh, retirement by yeah. uh, 25. So he could, they could all 90 of the 105 senators could potentially be uh, true to appointed. Yeah. That's probably pretty, pretty accurate. Um, you know, we've, they have to ret- you know, resign when they're 75. Yeah. And I know for us yeah. as a conservative group, I think 
by 2025, we might have 10 left right. um, by that next election. Uh, the independent Senate group are were all liberal senators, and when Trudeau punted them out of caucus, they became independent. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I think Trudeau, so Trudeau will not make the same mistake that, that Harper made by leaving a bunch of vacancies. He will make sure he stacks, he stacks. stacks it, mm-hmm. um, which is going to be a challenge for us when we form government, um, that we're going to have a, you know, a pretty hostile Senate at that time. So, you know, we're, we're going to have to look at uh, the Canadian senators group that uh, Don Tannis or Scott Tannis um, mm-hmm. leads, and we're going to have to start building some relationships within that group. Mm. But I think Trudeau is also, um, you know, he, he says they're independent, independent senators that, that they're being selected. He's not appointing them. But they are also causing him some, him some problems because they all have their own little pet projects and their own little own activist agendas. agenda. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they aren't exactly getting stuff done for him in a quick fashion either. Mm-hmm. Um, so that we know kind of what we're getting ourselves into here. But yeah, that's not really what the Senate was ever meant to be. It, it was no. never meant to be obstructionist. Yeah, It was meant to be that, that, that sober second thought, have a more regional perspective on things. Mm-hmm. Um, but as you said, you know, people weren't really paying attention to the Senate, but I think the no pipelines bill C69. Um, Pretty clear. Two, three, four. People are starting to pay attention to the Senate again. Mm-hmm. And it's funny, like we were getting senators really upset on two, three, four when this was going on. So, you know, I'm getting letters and emails and yeah, yeah. it's called being accountable for your decisions. Yeah. And just because yeah. you're in the Senate and you can't be unelected doesn't mean you're not accountable. Yeah. And you're not off the hook. You're not off the hook. And mm-hmm. Canadians have said, you know what, um, if you're representing my province or, uh, or another province, you still have to be, um, answer for the decisions you make. Cause mm-hmm. they just felt that they were, um, you know, untouchable. But uh, it's it's good to see Canadians start to step up and and the no pipelines bill, which really upset me because some of our Alberta senators voted uh, to support that legislation when they knew it was a clear attack on Alberta. Mm-hmm. Same as two three four, we had senators from Alberta and Saskatchewan um, vote uh, to oppose to put the amendments in to oppose two three four. Uh, if you're truly representing your region and your province, mm-hmm. then listen to your constituents. Yeah, listen to your Don't constituents. listen to to Gibo and Trudeau. Yeah, they've obviously been gotten to or yeah, whatever. But, but I don't know what they're getting. Like what, what do yeah. you offer a senator? Right. Right. It's like, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, you're not going to be in cabinet. You're, you know, there's no raise I can give you. No. You know, are you going to get a junket somewhere? Like, are you going to sell your soul for that? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. They've got a, a big bloated budget now too. It's like doubled uh, essentially, yeah. right. Since he took over 75 million to 130 or something like yeah, that. Yeah. As you've, as you've, these groups have become official you know, get official status, they get budget and all this stuff. And so that's where uh, these additional funds are coming from. Interesting. Well, there was another, there was another uh, private members bill that you put forward back. And I don't, actually my question first is this, what happens with the private members bill? Like how long can it stay out there before it's actually allowed to be voted or passed? Well, like it, how long can it linger around? It can linger for a parliamentary session. So once, you know, the session is over, an election is triggered, it, it dies. It dies. You have to start over again. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I was thinking of... Or else uh, unless it's, you know, if it, it it fails at a, re- you know, first, second, third reading. If it's voted down, it's it's over. It's over. Okay. Because yeah. I was yeah. thinking of another one you had in the past, which was that uh, C351, 351, uh, which was the free the beer <laughs> back <laughs> yeah. in the day. Yeah, that's right. Big fan of that one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Still, still working on that. A bit of a side hustle, but yeah. Side hustle. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's yeah. just about, uh, it, cause I don't think a lot of people even know or are aware that you no. can, you can, are not supposed to bring beer like across interprovincial borders. That's right. Uh, Alberta is a bit of a, uh, an anomaly because we have a, you know, a, an open system. Yeah. We got rid of the liquor boards, liquor boards, but mm-hmm. yeah, this, this came up as, uh, as funny. We were just t- talking about it today, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, you know, when you saw kind of that craft beer revolution started happening yeah. know, six or seven years ago, um, I had a couple of craft uh, brewers and actually some of my cattle guys that are, you know, wanted to sell their beef outside, uh, uh, to, you know, to, into Fernie, for example, like yeah. br- brewery that's in, in Lundbrek, Old Man Brewery said, I, I can't sell my beer into Fernie. I'm like, what do you mean? Yeah. I said, yeah, there's, there's these rules and my beef guy is saying the same thing and so I went, uh, did a little homework, and yeah, there's. Mm-hmm. It goes back to prohibition, the Intoxicating Liquors Act. Um, there are, you know, blockades, and yeah. and now it's kind of grown where uh, the LCBO in Ontario, the mm-hmm. liquor board, yeah, is yeah. the largest alcohol purchaser on the planet. 
On the planet. On the planet. I didn't know that. Because it's one body that buys all the alcohol from the province of Alberta, Mm -hmm. or Ontario, and Mm -hmm. its revenue is well in excess of $6 billion a year. It is a huge moneymaker for the province. For sure. So even though we have a conservative government in Ontario, they still will not dismantle um, this. They're kind of starting to tweak it now. Mm. Um, But this is all about protectionism. It's about, Mm. um, you know, allowing, uh, you know, the 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 overseers to, to kind of control everything. And, and yeah. it's not um, empowering small business and, and entrepreneurship and, and allowing consumers to make the choice that they yeah. want. Uh, it's like the opposite of what we really want. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so this is kind of how it, it happened. So I had a, mm. uh, actually Ron Ambrose said, well, we really, really like what you're doing here. Can we, can you do something with it? And she came, she came up with the free the beer <laughs> kind of slogan. And uh, yeah. I spent a year, really tough gig going across <laughs> Canada to, Beer festivals, Crushing and pints. <laughs> every craft beer guy yeah. I could go to, and trying to, and you're right. Most people had no idea that this was what was going on. That they could no. be moving, uh, moving alcohol. Uh, that's a weird one. Yeah. Well, they like tax and all the vice stuff, all the bad stuff. I guess uh, out the out the wazoo. And now, well, now taxes on on beer. Yeah. Right. This I mean, April huge. one. Let's just talk about that. Yeah. April one's a big day. Huge day. It's a huge day for Canadians. I, I hope Canadians understand just how painful. This April 1st is going to be. It's going to be bad. Yeah. Yeah. You've got carbon tax goes up 23%. And the thing that we always forget about that is that the GST is charged on top of the carbon tax. Yeah, it's on top on of top. the Tax carbon. on a tax. Should be illegal. Should not be allowed. Yeah. Uh, but this is um, being allowed to happen despite many efforts on our, or many attempts on our behalf to try and get this removed. But as you said, then the escalator tax goes up 5%. The mm-hmm. largest increase on a tax on beer, wine, and spirits in decades in Canada. Mm-hmm. Um, so when they, the Liberals brought in the escalator tax, this was really unique as well, where, in my opinion, and I would say the opinion of many kind of uh, procedural wonks, is that mm. this is not taxation by representation. Right. Because what this is, is that the Liberals put a tax on, on the, basically like the excise tax, a tax on beer, wine, and spirits, that's indexed to inflation. So it goes up every single year. Whether we sure. like it or not, there's no vote, no debate, no discussion in the House no of Commons. What. It goes up. Mm-hmm. Now, when they put this on in 2017, if I recall, mm-hmm. they probably, you know, interest rates were, you know, that 2%, yeah, not two, going up two too and much. And a half, yeah. yeah. But over the last few years, we've seen seven, seven, yeah. Now five. Yeah. So last year, when it went, that should have gone up 7%, again, we pushed back pretty hard. They capped it at two. Mm-hmm. They're not capping it this year. It's going to go up 4.7%, 5%. Yeah, that is just bonkers. I don't know. There's going to be a lot of, uh, yeah, there's going to be a lot of struggling people. Um, well, they, they, yeah, they kind of, they kind of say, well, it's, it's beer, it's wine, it's beer, it's, but it's not just that. It's the restaurants, it's the bars, yeah. it's the hospitality sector, mm-hmm. it's the farmers who are growing that malt barley for those breweries and, and distillers. So mm-hmm. this has a, a huge ripple effect through the economy. And when our, our hospitality industry is still struggling post COVID, mm-hmm. this, is this really the time that you want to whack yeah. them with uh, two taxes? Yeah, I don't see why. <clears throat> yeah, they've really hung their hat on it, um, yeah. on this, the climate, climate, climate stuff. Um, I, I don't want to say stuff because I don't want to, I'm not demeaning this push, but it's blatantly obvious that this is not the time to be hammering <laughs> people of, of all walks of uh, life in Canada. I just, I don't, I don't understand this. They're really going all in on it. Well, it, even if it, okay, if, if it was about the climate, that's one thing. Mm-hmm. But here, here's the, with the carbon tax specifically. Mm-hmm. It hasn't reduced emissions. Nope. And the whole idea of the carbon, th- we'll go back to two, three, four. The whole idea of the carbon tax is a tax that is going to make you change behavior. Right. Farmers have no other options, right? Like I, I can't, I, I can't use an electric combine. Nope. I can't heat my barns with a electric heat pump. Like yeah. I need propane. I need natural gas. So there's no alternative for me to switch to. And yet I'm still being punished. Yeah. So, you know, and, and our, my liberal NDP colleague says, you know, John, I don't know why you're so upset about the carbon tax. You know, I can take an electric vehicle or I can take my bike. That's great. You live in Toronto. Um, my farmer cannot haul his grain to the terminal in a Toyota Prius. Right. I can't get my cattle to the auction mart on the sea train. Like that's just not how it's the not, vast majority of our country <laughs> operates. No, it isn't. Uh, well, I have the benefit of uh, growing up in Ontario and understanding yeah. 
um, the discrepancies between the two. So I grew up, I grew up kind of like rural outside of Toronto, yeah. uh, Cambridge area. So yeah. a lot of farm, uh, like air, and there's a lot of farm. So I had a lot of farm buddies and then uh, city boys, you want to call it. But we kind of grew up not liking Toronto, <laughs> just far enough away. So you're just like us then? Yeah, just like us. <laughs> yeah. But I never really understood the 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 mood. Like when I first moved uh, west, which would have been Sask first. Yeah. So I don't know, whatever it was, early 90s. And I come and would say, you know, I'm from Ontario. And it would always be, ah, sorry about your luck. Or, <laughs> ah, it's a shame. You know, and I used to get offended by it. But over time, it's not a hatred. It's just that they do grow up in a yeah. bubble. They don't understand. And when you come west, um, there's more land. There's a lot more farmers. And it's just people just want to work hard yeah. and don't interfere with my paychecks. <laughs> That's right. That's <laughs> it's just right. let me earn my money how I want. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, that, that divide between the two. I just, hopefully we can help them make uh, them understand um, yeah, the I ramifications. Think, yeah, I think that a lot of it is certainly that. It's education. Yeah. And it's it's unfortunate that our and our current prime minister has a lot, you know, a lot on this, his shoulders for this, but our country's yeah. never been this divided. No, no question. We've seen, um, and I would think, you know, it's not so much East versus West for, the things that you're talking about, I think no. a lot of it is that urban rural mm-hmm. kind of divide where they don't understand because that rural Ontario, rural Quebec are very much like we are out yeah, here. Yeah, for sure they are. Um, yep. But I, I, this prime minister has gone out of his way to divide Canadians any way he can yep. by that region, by religion, ethnicity, mm-hmm. gender, everything he can to divide Canadians and distract Canadians. And it's unfortunate because your, your, your fundamental job as the prime minister, as a leader of this country is to unite our country on those things that we find in, in common. Mm-hmm. Uh, but that is not how this guy works. And that's, you know, I, I think he will go down in history as probably the worst prime minister in our history. Mm-hmm. Um, we're not there yet, but no. um, that would be my biggest takeaway is I've never seen uh, a prime minister who has demeaned and, mm-hmm. um, shown such disdain to certain parts of, of the country. And that's, that is just not what uh, his focus should be. Like, it's really disappointing. He's good at it. Like he, mas- good he it. masks it as a, these worthy causes and, and uh, fighting for people. And I will always stand up for this and that. And at the same time, yeah, he's divided people like I've never seen before. And we were already nervous. You know, when he got in in 15, fine. People want to change. Yeah. That's, that's democracy. Fine. Yeah. Um, but when he got in, I mean, everybody out here collectively shit their pants because we're talking <laughs> <laughs> Trudeau 2.0. 2. We were nervous. And, yeah. and so for anybody else who doesn't understand, talk to any boomer out here. <clears throat> you know, um, the National Energy Program, Pierre, brought that mm-hmm. on. I mean, people literally walked away from their homes. For sure. They threw the keys and walked away yeah. because that program smashed the West. Yeah. It Pe- destroyed People it. lost businesses, um, yeah. homes. It was, it was devastating. Mm-hmm. For sure. And I, I definitely had lots of people when we were door knocking 2015, like, do we not remember his dad? Do we not remember his dad? <laughs> and and Justin Trudeau didn't hide it. Like He's he always been open about his disdain for the West. And mm-hmm. um, some, some of the comments he made were, you know, geez, are we really, this is the, this is the guy that we're going to support. But like you said, he won fair and square. Let's give him a chance. Let's see what, what he can do. And um, I, I don't think uh, we're really surprised with, no. with where we're going. He's shown his stripes. Yeah. You know, he came, came right out of it. I don't know. I will just, we'll see where it ends up going, but I don't, I, I feel like people are finally waking up. And we always used to say that out here too, that they need to feel it in their pocketbooks out there. Yeah. And unfortunately, everybody's feeling it now. And so I do feel like the tide is turning. Um, but we'll see, of course. I don't know. You think he's going to... Uh, this This NDP uh, Liberal Coalition certainly has uh, buggered up everything. Yeah, this is really something we've never experienced in Canada before, to see this kind of a coalition that uh, this marriage is un- unbreakable. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, this... this f- farce of a pharmacare thing that the, they say they have it's not pharmacare it's not it's just how if my, my grandfather on my mom's side was a hardcore NDP. he was a union man yes yeah. engineer for cp yeah, for 50 guy. years yeah mm-hmm. sure um he would be extremely upset with what he's seen the ndp become, become and they, they've they've sold out for so cheaply yeah to uh, a party that they should fundamentally um should oppose disagree. yeah well they're just the same color 
Essentially. Same color. Yeah. yeah. But that's, you know, Trudeau has taken them so far to the left that they've become, mm-hmm. you know, they've really outlefted the NDP in many, in many ways. They have. Yeah, yeah, I know. It's pretty disheartening to see. And I don't think, that, obviously with this coalition, there's not going to be uh, <clears throat> any kind of a snap election or no no confidence uh, with that coalition in place. It's just, it's not going to happen. But I don't I fear, I mean, we want, we need him to run in the next election because we want him to lose. <laughs> <laughs> That's what yeah. I think. Yeah. We need him to run. I, yeah. I think we'd have be more in trouble if they propped up somebody else uh, now if he resigned, but he's too much of a narcissist to resign. Yeah. I, I don't see him resigning. I think his no. e- ego, he want he wants to take on Pierre, um, sure. which is great. We, I would take that in a heartbeat. Uh, it's no, con- it's no contest. It's no, no contest. Car. Yeah. That guy's a rock star. Yeah. And we see that in question period, you know, question period isn't, the be all and end all, but you can just see um, how well prepared Pierre is and how unprepared, um, despite being the prime minister for eight years, uh, yeah. almost nine, how unprepared uh, Trudeau is. This he doesn't answer questions. No, I mean, that's his art, <laughs> but that's his that's his angle. He just doesn't answer anything. Yeah, you know, it's you know, you get him off script, and he's he really struggles for sure. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, I don't. I, I want to say I don't think he'll go anywhere. But again, I don't see us ha- having election until. The you know, 2025. Yeah, lots of things can change, uh, but I just don't see any any incentive for the NDP Liberal coalition to to break this off. No, but, but who knows? Well, we got to just take our take our blows and batten the hatches <laughs> until the fall of 25 because they can do a lot of damage in that time too. And I mean, they're going to continue to push, right? Yeah. Well, it, for sure. Like you see this, um, the money that they're spending. Um, this this has an impact on on everyday Canadians for mm-hmm. sure. And like you said. Um, yeah, I guess the number one question I always get is like, how how is he still there? How does this guy keep yeah. going? Yeah. But to your point, you know, people really, especially Canadians, mm. don't really pay attention to what's going on in, in federal politics no. until they feel it. And now, like you said, they are feeling it. They when it comes to putting food on the table, paying mm-hmm. their mortgage, um, pay, you know, interest rates, all of these things, putting gas in your car, all of these. I I couldn't believe the gas went up thirty cents a liter in. In Alberta yesterday, right. so <laughs> I just you know yeah oh great I was driving up like what the oh, insufficient funds <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's right <laughs> well there was a big day yesterday in uh, well I mean I don't know if it was a big that big of a day it was a big day for conservatives uh, yeah a uh, great day um, in Durham there uh, oh I want to say his name right Jamil uh, Jamil how do I say his last name I think Giovanni Giovanni Jamil anyway. It's a big win because the Liberals were huffing and puffing like they were going to win it back. But, I mean, yeah. it was a landslide. And I think right? why it was so good and, and why we're excited about it is, is the number. Um, right. You know, by-elections are always tough, but usually, you know, the numbers are low, voter turnout's low. Mm-hmm. Um, my, my voter turnout, my by-election was ridiculous. <laughs> uh, but to have the highest number we've ever had in, I think, f- since the the parties merged, since you know, 40 years ago, um, that sends speaks a, volumes. It sends a huge message to, to Trudeau, especially like he he door knocked out there, ministers door knocked out there, Jagmeet Singh door knocked out there, and you know the NDP down to 10 10 percent. Um, yeah. I, I think this really was a, <clears throat> a a bellwether win for us. That's a message sender for sure. Yeah. Well, and he came out with personal attacks against the guy, and shocking. I mean, right? Yeah, shocking, weird, yeah. divide and conquer. Yeah, you know, a, a kid of of immigrants to Canada. Uh, cancer survivor, hardworking, you know, put him through himself through school, went mm-hmm. to a, a law graduate from Yale. Yeah. Um, but because he doesn't, you know, he fits the mold where Trudeau thinks, well, he should, he should be emboldened to the Liberal Party, right? Right. He's a man of color, yeah. uh, immigrant. Like, perfect for us. Perfect for, how could he not be supporting us? <laughs> what What is, there's something obviously wrong with this man. Yeah, yeah. Um, so let's just attack. Yeah, let's just attack. Let's demean him. And, uh, you know, we've seen that with anybody who, Jody Wilson, Ray Bold, mm. all, all these people who have yeah. pushed back. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, senior uh, Cesar Chavez, who was another uh, yeah. woman of color. That was Kitchener. Yeah. Think, right? yeah. Uh, Whitby. Whitby. Oh, Whitby. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you. Jane Philpot. Yeah. Jane Philpot. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You push back. Um, you are quickly discarded. So all of these, these uh, lovely comments that he makes about inclusion and diversity mm-hmm. is, it is just wallpaper. That yeah. is not who he is and what he. It is. isn't. No, no. He's a tyrant. For sure. He is a tyrant. Yeah. Well, and that um, uh, Jam- Jamil, he uh, yeah, he was like illiterate or, or 
couldn't read at 10. He was deemed illiterate in grade 10 yeah. and puts himself through school and gets himself a scholarship and he writes a book. And I mean, the guy, you can write a book about that guy and all he's doing yeah. is standing up for uh, what is, what he feels is right. Yeah. And don't, don't paint me into this kind of corner. Yeah. But this is where, you know, we're seeing Pierre um, bring in these, these new supporters, mm-hmm. right? Like we've, like we've never seen before young Canadians and mm-hmm. that, uh, you know, again, the NDP and the liberals just assume would be theirs, but these are young people who want to start a business. They also see they'll never own a home in Canada. Mm. Uh, you know, they, they can't afford to get out of mom and dad's basement. Um, and for for many uh, new Canadians or minorities that I've spoken with, mm. um, they're like, we are sick and tired of being, like we're supposed to be um, upset about something. You know, we're supposed to be, um, you know, divided from, we just want to be something. Canadian, right? Yeah, we, we just want to work and live and yeah, stay out of our... Yeah, stay out of our everyday life. Yeah, they're hardworking, they're business owners, that's mm-hmm. what they want. They don't want to be uh, divided into some special little little group and be upset if they're not. And yeah. that's uh, that's not what they that's not who that's not what they came to Canada for. No, that isn't. Yeah. Well, and, and uh, Pierre, he is uh, I mean, our family again. <laughs> we love Pierre. Uh, we do think he's a rock star. Of course, before he yeah. ran, we felt like he was a rock star. Yeah. But I don't think he's not not the only one. I mean, you know, you've got a good, this collection of, um, you know, from, um, well, Leslin Lewis to Michelle Ferrari to, I don't know, Michelle uh, Rempel, Garner, and Melissa Lanceman, um, you know, uh, Scott Davidson. Um, there's just so many, I feel, uh, and of course yourself. <laughs> oh, yeah. I was going to leave you out of it just for a joke. <laughs> <laughs> not you, I, not yet. You'll, 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 you'll have your turn. That's how I could take it. Yeah. <laughs> um, I just feel like it's, yeah, I just, it's, I feel like it's a rock star team. I really do. There's so many strong MPs out there and, and, and MLAs as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's really fun to watch right now. Well, not, not fun, but. Well, I, that, actually, uh, that's just a message. Pierre, Pierre and I were texting this afternoon, and yeah. that's the message I sent him. You know, was, you know, savor this win that you had last night. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think the most important thing is like the team that you've put together. The team that we have is, you know, second to none. I would put mm-hmm. us up against anybody. And but it, a lot of that goes to Pierre, where he has made sure that we're united, focused. Um, you know, we're not taking anything for granted. We're working hard every single day. Um, we haven't won anything yet. No. And no. he's adamant that uh, you know, we have to earn every single vote every single day. And mm-hmm. you have a, a group of really talented people, but they're also passionate and committed about doing the right thing. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And you've, you know, Melissa Lanceman's a good, good example. <sighs> She's I, a pit bull. I brought her to Stampede last year and Did you? give her their, yeah. the Western hospitality. Yeah. And I think we're going to get a corn dog of all things. And uh, I just couldn't believe how many Stampede employees, you know, guys on the, on the tilt to oh, world that, that newer. Yeah. Like, can I get my picture taken with you? I'm like, I, oh, I'm that is from awesome. here. Like, what are you guys doing? You're like, I'm here. I, I like, this uh, is my I'm, house. I'm, I'm, <laughs> can you hold the, can I take, can you take the camera for me, please? Like, yeah, all right. I'll take the picture. Oh but, yeah. Yeah. This is the, the brand that they've built and, uh, mm-hmm. you know, they're, they're so good and their, their messaging is, and I don't know if you saw Scott Davidson's video yesterday. I did. Of the XS oh, with the beer, with the, the, the beer, <laughs> this ice fishing. Hoser. Hose yeah. off you hosers. Oh. Don't hose, don't hose us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so good, so good. Yeah, sharp. I like it. Well, you gotta. Hey, everybody's got to up their game now too. Like it's all different. Everything's on here now. Yeah, too, and um, v- video bursts and. But and I think the most important. The, yeah, the most important thing though is, is we're not talking about ideological, you know, policies and, and no. pushing our thing. We are talking about the issues that everyday Canadians, like your family, yeah. are talking about every night at the dinner table. These are the things that are impacting me. Yeah, I'm not talking. You know. I'm not talking about uh, a carbon tax in Ukraine or, uh, you know, any other kind of, I hate to use the word woke, but any other little woke pet project that Mm -hmm. the the liberal NDP coalition is talking about. We're talking about the things that Canadians care about. Yeah. I feel like it's just, they're completely distracted. We, I mean, anybody that, you know, that we talk to, everybody's just sick. Like focus over here. Yeah. (laughs) What are we looking at this fluff for? Like uh, you're, uh, yeah, cratering to the minority of voices, and it seems like, and uh, emboldening them to emboldening them to have a larger voice. Then it's, are we really worried about this right now? People can't eat. Yeah, you know. But you got a you know an environment minister that's talking about you know we're not going to build any more roads. Uh, we're going to be a hundred percent electric. Well, which is kind of an, uh, an odd <laughs> conundrum in itself. We're going to be a hundred percent electric vehicles by two thousand and fifty. Yeah, uh, you know. 
Canadians are starting to realize, like, okay, these guys are so out of touch, and what they're saying makes no sense. Makes no sense. And who are they talking to? Because they're not talking to us as Canadians. They're clearly I don't know not. Who they're talking to? So, uh, you know, all of these things are kind of starting to build up. Like mm-hmm. you said, that the cost of living crisis. I'm feeling it. Mm-hmm. But it's also like you guys have no idea. You no idea what we're dealing with in in real life and. It's, we've just had enough. Yeah, they're not listening. And, you know, you have this big EV push. Okay, well, I mean, it's great in theory, and it could potentially work over time, but, I mean, you still have to dig up the earth for lithium and batteries, <laughs> and are we going to recycle the batteries? And yeah. can't recycle solar panels, can't recycle wind turbines. It's like, let's just use our heads here. Yeah, You have the greatest minds in the energy sector right here in our own nation. Yeah, Why don't you consult <laughs> and ask, <laughs> yeah. is this feasible? Right. <laughs> Let's just be realistic. Yeah. I, I agree with you. I, th- I think we will get to some of these things, whether it's electric cars or hydrogen. Sure, it's great. But you can't force it. No. You can't just say, we're going to do it by this day. Yeah. When, you know, for example, this summer, over the last two summers, in well, the, the cold snap we had in January and the, the heat we had in the, su- in the summer. Yeah. The city of Calgary was telling people, do not plug in your electric vehicles. We don't have the grid. We don't have the power in the grid. Mm-hmm. That's with 5%. Of electric vehicles. Yeah. What are you going to do in 2035 when we're supposed to be at 50%? Like, are you, we, we literally do not have the infrastructure no, we don't. Yeah. to make this, to make this possible, let alone even realistic. It's just not possible. No. So let's start talking about things that we can do, mm-hmm. uh, things that are, um, that we can accomplish. Yeah. But let's let those innovators, let's let the energy sector, agriculture sector, mm. um, get there. Let, let's incentivize them to get there rather than, yeah. you know, punish, yeah. you know, hammer them. You know, agriculture is a great example. This, this study came out from uh, the Global Institute for Food Security a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. So again, we get back to two, three, four and the carbon tax and, and they, they are punishing farmers and they have no, no alternative. Mm-hmm. But the fact is Canadian agriculture is by far more efficient and sustainable than any other country in the world. Mm-hmm. So for example, and, and this is the facts of the, this study, yeah. A ton of canola grown in Saskatchewan, the carbon footprint of that canola is 67% lower than anywhere else in the world. Right. You can take a, a train load of Canadian wheat. It could travel around the world three and a half times before it has the same carbon footprint as wheat grown in Europe. So why are we punishing these? And they did this through innovation and yeah. precision agriculture, zero till, seed varieties, all these. They didn't do it because they were forced to with a carbon tax. No, they didn't. They did that because of the right thing to do. Yeah. So let's let them do it. Let's let them do They know what they're doing. Yeah, let's reward them for it. Yeah. Let's recognize it. Mm-hmm. But we're punishing them. And it just, it's nonsensical. Yeah, it is nonsensical. Well, and then you've got the, I wouldn't have to get into it right now, but, you know, the emissions cap on the industry. I've got a <clears throat> CEO of Birchcliff Energy coming in here later this week. We're probably going to hammer on that, I'm sure. But um, I did want to touch on something else. Um from your past, if you if you don't oh, geez. if you don't Let's mind, <laughs> who did you t- who did you talk you, to? You there's a mug shot of you <laughs> in the National Enquirer. <laughs> no, no, uh, you got to hold my yearbook. Oh no, <laughs> no, uh, something that that hit close to home for you, um, and I think that would have been around two fourteen with your daughter, mm. um, and that you know invo- that got you involved with you know the opioid crisis that kind of hit close home to you maybe yeah. you can tell us what went on that you kind of yeah i was uh yeah shortly after i was elected um mm-hmm. you know raised raise our kids and we'd never had a problem with them before and mm-hmm. they're always you know great kids um but yeah my we couldn't get my daughter moved to to calgary we mm-hmm. couldn't get a hold of her for a few weeks and started to, as any parent would, start to panic. Uh, went up to her apartment, couldn't get an answer. So I kind of broke, broke into the building <laughs> and uh, just pounded on her apartment door. Oh, until, it's your daughter. Yeah, it's my daughter. Yeah. Um, and she, I pounded on the door until she answered the door. And when she opened the door, um, I didn't recognize, recognize the face staring mm. back at me. And um, she had been on, you know, a boy got her on fentanyl. And mm. uh, she had uh, probably been in the midst of, a, of an overdose that, so who knows if I, if I didn't Ugh. get up there, what would have happened? But why I've, I've become so passionate about this issue is, um, you know, two things. I, I took her to the South Health campus and the staff was amazing. Like they were so good. And Incredible. She, she yeah. wasn't the only person that's come through here. Mm-hmm. But what I was shocked about is that once she'd been 
you know, assessed and they realized what's going on. And they, uh, we kind of kept her there for a few hours to let her kind of come out of it. Um, they said, yeah, you can just take her home. I said, what do you mean? Just take her home. Yeah. Like, how's that work? There's gotta be treatment and recovery, right? Yeah. Like, no, that's, that's up to you. You can hear some options for you. It's like, over. You're, you're kidding. Like if I let her go back to her apartment with that, that the boyfriend, like, what do you think is going to happen yeah. tomorrow? Like, there's no way this is the only option. Let's do the math here. Yeah. So, you know, obviously we started working on, on what was available on treatment and those types of things. But the, the, the second part is just this road that we've gone down in Canada, in BC specifically, but mm. where the answer has been this, the safe supply decriminalization. Uh, I, I don't understand the logic of this. And obviously it's not working. We've never seen no. a, a crisis like this in Canada. Mm-hmm. So I've, I've been become a very strong advocate for um, the focus needs to be on treatment and recovery. Uh, mm-hmm. I've done lots of work for the the party and, and coming up with some platform ideas and, and uh, you know worked with the a little bit with the provincial government here with, with Marshall mm-hmm. Smith, the, the premier's chief of staff, and coming up yeah. with the strategy here in Alberta, which I think is they're going down the right way, mm-hmm. building these eleven treatment and recovery centers across the province, shutting down the. the the supervised injection sites. Um, I just don't believe that that is the the direction to go. You are just um, perpetuating the inevitable. And the argument that the safe supply harm reduction folks will give you is like, well, we're, we're saving people's lives. Well, today. Sure. But you're keeping them addicted. They They're will, they will overdose time and time again and eventually likely die, unfortunately. But also the impact it's having on our communities. Yeah. Uh, and you see... But Vancouver, Seattle. It's out of control. It has become. Like this is, it's, it's insane to me. Uh, yeah. That we're we're legalizing insane. these hard drugs and, and it's, uh, this is not the way we can go. Like our, our country is, mm-hmm. is becoming decaying in, in some of our downtowns. Yeah. Well, I know like, obviously you're, you're responsible for agriculture and agri-food and food security, but this yeah. one obviously hit you close to home. Yeah. Um, yeah, but I don't see the uh, relevance of continuing to keep them on. I mean, they choose to look at the human side, but we're looking at the human side too. Yeah. You know, uh, we're just keeping them on the drugs and we're offering them up for free for real. Yeah. And we're putting them on a list and you can go shop like a retail store. Right. And it's, it, it, but it becomes, it's worse than that. And, and my daughter would be the first one to sit here and say, this is wrong. Right. Uh, and she's the one that, you know, thankfully she's doing wonderful. She's great. Uh, she's a brave, strong young woman yeah. that that's uh, sort of empowered me to, to talk about this. Cause she's kind of hooked up with the wrong person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, hey, she's a kid. Yeah, right? I want people to know this can happen to anyone. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. But at the end of it, I wanted my daughter back. Yeah. And by offering her free hard drugs, <laughs> this is not a way I'm going to get my daughter back. But yeah. it leads to diversion where these folks go to the – the supervised injection site is because it's not safe. There's no such thing as pumping yourself with toxic chemicals is safe, but they take that stuff, the hydromorphone, which is just as strong as heroin. Mm -hmm. They take it to the schoolyard, the playground, the sports center, and they sell it to kids. And then they take that money and go buy the fentanyl they they want. Right. So then they are not being treated. They are staying addicted, but then they are also grooming that next generation of addicts. And that's exactly what's happening. And they're, it's insane that they are just doubling down on this. It's like, oh no, if we, we're just not giving them enough. They're destroying our communities. Yeah, I don't, uh, it just seems like, yeah, they've gone so far over to the left. It's, I don't even call that left. I don't even know what that is. It's the yeah. definition of insanity to me. It's, and how they're, this has been going on for a long time and the numbers are, you know, getting worse. So yeah. I'm not sure where they, they can, are um, they just too far down? They don't want to admit they were wrong? <laughs> you know, I don't yeah, know like, why. Well, that seems like a that seems like a JT trait, right? I mean, he just yeah. double, doubles down when uh, if he thinks yeah. he's l- I don't lose. Well, and I saw in, you know an right. article yesterday that I know Pierre shared that uh, BC is now looking at free crystal meth. You know, I so saw that article as well. I haven't had a chance to read it, but uh, yeah, I just saw the same thing. I saw the I saw the headline. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And rolled my eyes. Yeah, as soon as I saw Pierre <laughs> share it, I'm like, oh no, this I can't believe this is I can't believe this is happening. And here we go. Yeah, yeah, and we we know like. When I talk to um, you know professionals across Canada, around the mm. world, when I was you know doing a white paper for the party, the the answer I got from everybody was pretty much it's not that there's a lack of money, no, there's a lack of metrics to measure success on what works and what doesn't, and mm. they are just throwing it everywhere. And for the most part, they just want to tick a box and say, oh, we've we've given a billion dollars to yeah, this, see? And, yeah. but 
if you refocus that money onto treatment and recovery, mm-hmm. then we're actually going to help solve the problem. And a big portion into, you know, obviously we got to crack down on, on gri- uh, crime. gangs and crime yeah. and, and that sort of thing. And mm-hmm. this catch and release stuff that the liberals have, we didn't talk about that, but no. that they've gotten is just mm-hmm. causing mm-hmm. crime and chaos in our communities as well. And mm-hmm. all of these things are interconnected and why we're seeing this they stuff are. explode. It's chaos everywhere, right? Yeah. It, yeah. it just seems that way. And then uh, it's a scandal after scandal guy that could, he just walks away from everything unscathed yeah. right yeah but the crime um like you said um i i don't like i just feel like we're we keep seeing more articles of more people being released arrested and then released and then and then they chase them down and bring them back and and they just keep recommitting yeah so i don't really understand where we're going with that well, if you talk, you know, in your podcast, you talk to first responders and they, they are just as frustrated, you know, whether that's RCMP or city police, mm. they are just as frustrated as we are. So they yeah. dole, they put in the work to catch, you know, criminal A mm-hmm. and the criminal A will just laugh at them. It's like, I'll be out before you finish the out. paperwork. And that they're right. They're gaming <laughs> they're the system. Right. They're gaming the system. Yeah. They know it. Um, and, you know, there's articles about Chilean gangs. We've had to put visas back on on Mexican immigrant or Mexicans coming to Canada mm-hmm. because around the world, this isn't just a Canadian problem anymore. No, a, criminals around the world now see the joke that Canada's criminal justice system has become under Justin Trudeau, and yeah. they are literally importing crime into Canada because they know, like, so you get a free so, free ride, free ride. If we get caught, we're released, and we just keep going. And it's if we it's if we go for six months, it's worth it. Yeah. So yeah. that's what, you know, the sign is out in neon <laughs> bright lights. Criminals come to Canada. Welcome. Well, <laughs> welcome. You're not going to pay taxes anyway, so don't worry no, about no, it. No, no, <laughs> no. Drugs are free. Yeah. Crime is rampant. You know, with the, you know, cars, drugs, cars perfect. being stolen and all that stuff. Like, mm-hmm. um, I've, I've never seen Canada kind of fall into this sort of disrepair under, under a government that just doesn't seem to, it's under their watch, mm-hmm. under policies that they are implementing. Mm-hmm. And so it's not even that they don't care that it's not that they're not paying attention. This is a direct result of policies that they've implemented. Yeah, I I totally agree with that. And I I was speaking like wait, this is how we got hooked up here when I was speaking with Brad yeah. Bannister on here, buddy of buddy of ours. Yeah, um, we were yapping away about it. And I just I I mentioned there that I just I feel like they're just. It's like they're doing it on purpose. Like they just want to go down in flames. Like they just, <laughs> it's like, we're just going to sabotage ourselves into oblivion and we're just going to blow up this place. It just feels like that. It's like you know, I, I never thought of it that way, but kind of picture him just walking with throwing the matches. He goes, just <laughs> yeah. cool guys don't look at explosions. Right? Will <laughs> yeah, Ferrell. That's, that's right. <laughs> Unfortunately, yeah. we're going to have to be there to, to clean up the mess. Yeah, that's right. <clears throat> well, um, I think we've covered a lot of ground there. And I just uh, really uh, grateful for you to to come on in. Pleasure. And, uh, fingers crossed for twenty twenty five, and uh, um, best of luck. Uh, I guess what is the next step now with two three four? Sorry, did, did yeah, uh, two th- we're, we're we're trying to. So we got two steps right now. Yeah, remove the amendments. Yeah, get those amendments out. Get those amendments out, and then vote yeah. on it as as a, as an original form. Yeah, or it goes ahead as amended. So we're. We're trying to battle to get the block back on side. And, the and it's not happening. It's not happening. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, anyway, keep keep fighting the good fight, buddy. And, uh, yeah, I appreciate it. Stop the puck. <laughs> <laughs> I will do my best. And I know it's uh, thanks very much for, for yeah. having us on here anytime that we can, mm-hmm. we can talk about the issues. And I know it's sort of been doom and gloom, a lot of the stuff that we've talked about. But, you know, honestly, um, maybe Canadians aren't seeing it, but I am very optimistic about where Canada will be in a year or two from now. Mm-hmm. Yes, we're we're gonna have to suffer through maybe another year of, of uh, Trudeau and, and Jagmeet Singh, but I know we have a leader in Pierre Polyev who truly cares mm-hmm. about Canada, wants a united, strong Canada, wants Canada to be what we were not only here but on the global stage. Mm-hmm. But I know he's got the Canada's well positioned to take advantage of opportunities when you have a team and leader that's that's, that's there that wants to have, see that happen because mm-hmm. the world needs what Canada has natural resources, agriculture, yeah. energy, all of these things. Yeah. They're begging for it. So I know what once we become in government and peers, you know, it's not going to be easy, but we're going to be able to turn Canada into the global powerhouse it should be and can be. Mm-hmm. We have the innovation, we have the resources, we have the people. 
Um, we just have to unleash that, and I know we can do it. And we certainly need to unleash that. And I, yeah. Well, I have faith in you guys. We're, uh, yeah, we're very supportive and uh, hopeful for the future. Yeah, yeah, we're excited too. <laughs> yeah, it's just uh, I would. I wish the election was tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, get in the ring. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> All right, awesome. Thanks for uh, being here with me, John. That's really my pleasure. It. Anytime. Awesome.